Hi, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. Um, today I'm going to be looking at a very particular logic pattern that occurs in the more difficult Sudoku uh, that you might see. Uh, and this is called the Swordfish. And we've done a few videos over the months on this pattern. Uh, it comes up occasionally. Um, but I thought given that we've had a lot of new subscribers over the last week or two, it might be worth revisiting it now. Uh, and what prompted me to think about this is that we had a request uh, by email. Um, this puzzle that you can see in front of you on the screen um, where uh, somebody has been trying to solve the puzzle. They've reached a particular point and they've put it in one of these computer generated or computer solvers. And the solver has said it needs a swordfish pattern and they don't know what a swordfish pattern is. So uh, I'm going to try and solve it in a minute um, uh, and explain what it is we're looking for uh, so that we can see how to make progress assuming I can spot the swordfish of course. Now let's just do a quick refresher then on what a swordfish is. Now I think the easiest way to look at this if I can uh, find a good example, not that one, this one. So this is something I've just set up in the uh, in Duncan Sudoku software which is the uh, computer program I tend to use for my solving on the channel. It's very good at entering pencil marks. And this isn't a swordfish, this is an X-wing. But we first, before we understand what a swordfish is, we first need to understand the X-wing. So this is a very simple example because if we look down column 3 and column 7, you can see that the 3's in both cases are res entirely restricted to uh, rows uh, 3 and row 7. There's no other place that a 3 can go. And if you come across this sort of pattern, you need to think about the implications of it now, because they are profound. Um, because if you see this pattern, we can state then with certainty that we cannot have oops, a 3 in any of the positions that I'm highlighting in the grid. It's impossible. And you may say, well, how do we know that? Well, the reason we know it is we have to think about uh, what the two possible states of existence are regarding threes when it comes to column three and column seven. So if, for example, this is a three, if this is the real three in the final grid, then looking at column seven now, there's only one position that the three can go in column seven. It will be here. So this forms one limb of our x. Now the only other situation that could exist is that this is not a 3 and therefore this would be a 3. And if we looked at the finished solution and we found that this was a 3, we would know with certainty therefore, looking at column 7, that this was the th a 3. You see if this can't be a 3, this must be a 3 and therefore we get the other limb of the x. So we have this x shape where we know that the 3's are locked into exactly two possible arrangements, either here and here, or here and here. Now what's the implication of that? Well it means there can't be threes, for example, there, cannot, there can never be a three in this square where the cursor is now, because it will either be eliminated by there being a three in this square, or this square. One of those things must be true. Now, so this is the basic X-wing pattern. Now what people found um, when they first started to study Sudoku is that there's no reason why we have to limit this this situation to sort of two dimensions, if you like. We can introduce um, we can introduce a third row and a third column. So how might we do that? Let me just try and do this with the software. Okay, so I've I've amended the example slightly to introduce um, one further open square, if you like, in each of these columns, and a third column where there are again three possible positions the number three. Now the X-wing logic works just as well in this situation. We just have to learn how to apply it. So if you find a situation where you manage to lock a number into three positions in a column or a row and you find two other columns where those numbers are, uh, well that same number is limited to exactly the same rows, you can see that that's the case in this, this example, well, what does it mean? Well, let's think about it. So one possibility, so what's a good way of thinking about this? Could this square ever contain a three? Let's put it in. 
and let's ask ourselves that question. Can this square ever contain a 3? Let's imagine in the finished grid this was a 3. What would the implication be of that? This is a 3. Obviously there's no 3 in either of those two positions. So looking now at column 7 of the grid, we would know the 3 was either here or here. Looking at column 9, we would know the 3 was either here or here. Now this arrangement of 3's is exactly, this is an x-wing, this is exactly what we've just been speaking about. Because we know that in the finished solution now, either this will be a 3 and this will be a 3, or this will be a 3 and this will be 3. And either way round, this square here definitely can never be a 3. And we can extrapolate that logic um, to actually any of the positions. This can't be a 3, this can't be a 3. In fact, I'll label all of the positions in this grid that cannot contain the 3, just so that you can test it yourselves. It's not a bad idea to just mentally go through it um, and just convince yourself that what I'm saying is correct. So none of the squares that I've just highlighted could ever contain a 3. And this arrangement in three dimensions is called a swordfish. Not easy to spot them, we're going to try in a minute, but this is what we're looking for. Now, in fact, uh, you can extend this logic into uh, more dimensions. I think four is called a jellyfish. If you find four rows, uh, four columns with um, this matching pattern, five is a squirm bag. Never seen a squirm bag, um, but uh, I've certainly never spotted one. But this is the thing we're looking for. Right, short hiatus there with the childcare. And now back to the puzzle, and we're going to play Hunt the Swordfish. So let's start. Uh, we'll start with standard notation, by which I mean if a number can go in exactly two positions in a 3x3 three three block, as is the case with the numbers 1 in the central 3x3, three three, I make little pencil marks. Now, one thing it's important to note, Snyder notation, which is what this notation is called, is extremely good and powerful for spotting uh, sort of box logic, if you like. And the relationship in two positions between boxes can also be brought out by Snyder notation. But Snyder notation is particularly poor at dealing with triples. Whether the triples are um, you know, in the same column, hidden triples can be very hard to see with Snyder notation. And for that reason, spotting swordfishes with side of snide notation is very awkward. Um, so we're really going to be, have to be on our guard in order to spot the swordfish, I suspect, when we start off using Snyder notation. So let's go any, for, any further anyway. We've got two here and a two here. So I can lock the twos into one of those two positions in this 3x3 three three block. And that means in this 3x3 three three block, the two must be in this square. Ah, now twos in this 3x3 three three block are also restricted over onto this side now. Ah, in fact, we can go further than that because two there. So we get to place another two in the grid. And that means we can pencil mark twos down here. Now this two is nice. Now look at the impact of this two on this 3x3 three three block. The, the important square it eliminates the two from is this one, i.e. the square that corresponds with row 8. Because now... The twos in this 3x3 three three block are somewhere locked into either row 7 or row 9, i.e. they're in exactly the same rows as the twos in this 3x3 three three block. So I now know that I haven't been able to place a 2 yet in row 8. So when I come to this 3x3 three three block, the 2 must be in row 8. So it must be in one of these three positions. And look, we have a 2 here and a 2 here. So in fact, this is a 2 as well. Let's just tidy up the notation because I don't want to notate triples in boxes. So that's a good spot though. Um, right, what next? Sixes. We have a six here, a six here, a six here, a six here. So this is going to have to be a six. It's the only position a six can go into. And fives. I can see we can pencil mark fives. So we have a five here and a five here. So we can pencil mark fives into one of those two squares. That means we've got a five into one of these two squares. 
Ah, but we've also got a 5 here and a 5 here. So, in fact, there's pencil mark 5s there, and that means this is not a 5. This must be a 5 here. Okay, no signs of swordfishes yet. Um, right, let's do a hunt around the grid for more pencil marks. Ones, twos, three, threes down here. Fours. Wow, that's interesting. Now, <laughs> this is a this is an extremely um, odd tip I'm about to give you because there is no logical basis for it. And having said that Snyder notation was rubbish at spotting um, swordfishes, I'm about to slightly disagree with that. I have noticed uh, through doing a lot of swordfish puzzles using Snyder notation over the years that. Um, sometimes if you get the Snyder notation offset like this, so you can see these fours here are not in the same row or column. And same here, they're not in the same row and column. Now I've noticed that in puzzles that contain swordfishes, this tends to be a feature. Now I don't know why it is, I'd love uh, if anyone out there is a brilliant logician and is able to sort of point to why they think this might be the case. I'd be interested to, to hear about it because it's certainly true that where you get this repeat, where the same number is repeatedly offset using Snyder notation in different boxes, it can be a clue that this is the number that is the subject of the swordfish. So we certainly will take a look at fours during the solve. Again, another one there. Uh, Anything more we can do with fours? It feels like fours are important. No, I'm not seeing anything more. Fives we've already looked at. Sixes we've looked at. Sevens there's hardly any in the grid. Eights there's only one in the grid. Nines, no. And there's only two nines and they are not really complementary. Right, so let's, let's study fours. Right, where can a four go? in column one. We go here obviously, can't go here, can go here. So we've limited the four here to two positions. So if we were hunting for X wings or swordfishes, this is a nice this is a nice find. This might mean that we're on the right track. No in column two there's already a four. Column three four go here, here, here Okay, so there's three positions for the four in column three, and the important thing to note is that uh, in two of these positions we don't have a match with column one. So that's not looking to me like it's it's terribly helpful. But let's carry on. Fours in column four. Again, it's it's three three positions, three different rows, and very little overlap between. Uh, column one, column three. Let's try column five. Uh, okay. Well, at least we've limited it to two positions in column five, and one of those positions does overlap with column one. So the chance of a swordfish is there now. What we'd be looking for is a column where the fours are limited to just row three and row 8, although obviously it could also be in row, f um, which other row as well, this one, but actually it's not going to be able to be in this one because we already have fully notated row 6. Right, so let's carry on, no 4 there, no 4 there, in this column we have 4s in 3 positions, none of which are terribly helpful. So this is our last chance, column 9, and we do have one there, no, yeah, there we go, and it is. So let's study, I'll add some highlighting afterwards, but we've now located three different columns where the fours are restricted to exactly the same subset of three rows, and those rows are row 3, row um, 6, 
add row 8. So now we need to think about how we're going to be able to use this fact to make more progress. Now remember from the work we did earlier, what does the swordfish allow us to do? Well, it allows us to eliminate fours, for example. Now we have to be careful here because we can eliminate more than one four and they might all be important. So let's, let's start with this one. We can eliminate this four. This is impossible. This can't be a four. And you can see it's quite an interesting square. What can this square be? It can't be a one. It can't be a two. It can't be a three. It can't be a four because of the swordfish. It can't be a five or a six. Can it be a seven? Uh, it looks like it can be a seven. It can't be an eight or a nine. So seven is the only option for this square. So there's our first deduction that was exclusively made because of the presence of the swordfish. Now, let's just check the rest of this row now. So we need uh, one, four, and eight, one, eight, four, eight, one, four. Okay, I can't see how to make more use of this. So let's look for other positions we could we could have used the swordfish in. And one possible candidate obviously is this square. This square cannot contain a four anymore. So why does that matter? Let's have a look down column three. So what do we need? We need one, four, five, seven, and eight. So this square can only be 7 or an 8 now. It can't be 1, 5, and it can't be 4 because of the swordfish. So this becomes a double. This square can be lots of things. Oh, well, this square, 1, 4, 5. This square can only be a 7 or an 8. So again, here we've got another pattern emerging. Because we were able to eliminate a 4 from this square because of the swordfish, there is a hidden 7, 8 pair now in column 3. And we're left with having to place the numbers 1, 4, and 5. And look, this square here has a 1 and a 4 already in the box. This square is a 5. Well, that could be huge. That means Snyder notation, we can put pencil mark 5 in here. 5, 5, 5. This 5 means, ah, so we've got 5 here and a 5 here. So this is a 5, right? Oh, this is nice. This is nice because at the moment I place this 5 into this square, I'm consuming one of the two positions that a 4 could go into in column 9. So I am disturbing one of the positions of my swordfish. Now that is going to, because this swordfish is, it, it has two rows in each column, I'm going to be able to completely unwind the swordfish. Let me show you how. So I place the 5 here, let's put the pencil marks in just to keep track of everything. But now this square cannot be a 5, we need a 4 somewhere in column 9, so the only square is now this one. Now this has an effect immediately on column 1, because we knew in column 1, us from the swordfish, the 4 was either in this square or this square. Well it's no longer here, so it must be here. Again, I just need to keep track of the pencil marks now. So where can a 4 go here and in this square? This 4 here also rules out a 4. I mean, I'm going to be able to complete all the 4s. Unwinding the swordfish means this is a 4, this is a 4, and I think this square is a 4. So there we go. So let's eliminate all our 4 pencil marks now. And see where this takes our solve. So we've got the 7, 8 here. Um, one, seven, pencil mark sevens into these two squares. Sevens here, sevens forced upwards here. One, seven, eight down this column. That's no good. And three, eight, nine across this row. So this is an eight, nine. I feel I should be able to do something more here. Threes can now be, oh, not sixes, threes into one of those two positions. Two, three, nine down here. 
So again, this three here means there's a three either in this position or this position. And looking across this row, I need to place one and eight into the open positions, and I can't resolve that yet. Ah, one's here and one's here, so I can pencil mark some ones there, look, and that is useful. Ah, good. That gives me a one here and a seven and an eight. Let's make sure we use all our pencil marks. You can see seven here and seven here, and this seven mean this square must be a seven. Ones are forced into oops, ones are forced into one of those two positions. That impacts on the one here. This has got to be a one now. And a three, eight, nine. Threes are forced upwards. Ah. Oh no, that's no good. This three here. And we got threes into one of those two positions. I could have probably pencil marked that earlier, but it's not terribly helpful. Uh, unless I'm missing something, which is always possible. Um, so eight's got to be in one of these two positions. That matches this eight, locks an eight into one of those two squares. Still not terribly useful. So these two squares here, what are we looking at? Eight and nine into these two positions. Uh, I'm just going to pencil mark this for a moment while I just stare at the grid, if that's all right. Eight and nine. Do, 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 do. Uh, yes, OK. Now, here's another bit of... This is a very clever puzzle, actually. Um, so we've got an eight and a nine locked into these two squares. Now, let's have a look now at where we can place an eight in row number nine of the grid. Where does an eight go? This eight here prevents there from being an eight in this square, and this eight here prevents there from being an eight in this square. So the eights are locked into identical columns, and we know from our earlier work this is an x-wing. And that matters because that means we're now able to eliminate any other eights that we can find in column six and column seven. Well, can you see an 8 that's going to be eliminated? This 8 here is going to be eliminated, which means that this is an 8. Perhaps that will be nice. Is that going to give me anything extra? 8. Uh, yes, it is. Goodness me, this is, this is a beautiful puzzle, but very, very difficult. Because now look at the effect of this 8 on this 3x3 three three block. Now, you may say, well, it doesn't give you that much. It doesn't, but it gives me enough because it locks the eights again into one of three positions, but most importantly, it locks it into either row seven or row nine. Now, let's have a look. Where can an eight go in this block? Again, I don't know really where it goes, but I know it's locked into row seven or row nine because row eight is full. So therefore, in this three by three block, Row 8 has got to contain the 8, and this 8 here means this square is the only place an 8 can go, and that's huge, because not only does it give me this 8, but it unwinds this 7, 8 double that we had. So that's got to be like that. This 7 here must be helpful. Uh, well, not as helpful as I was hoping, but we're certainly, I think, on the right track for a solution. So 6 and 9 now here. Six and nine here, damn. Six, nine, six, nine. Six, nine. Eight, nine. Is there anything else I can do? I don't think there is with the uh, pencil marks there. Two, four, eight, one, four, three. As usual when live solving, this is this is the disastrous scenario when you sort of grind to a halt and you just can't see the next step. Ah, okay, there it is. So let's have a look at row eight now. This nine is very important, isn't it? Because we can't put a nine here, therefore it must go here, which resolves the nine and the three. 
and that means that this is a 3, which means that this is a 3. Let's tidy up all the 3s now. We can remove the pencil mark 3s. This must be a 6. This must be a 9. Uh, does the 6 do anything for us? Yes. This now is a 6. Be careful with the pencil mark 6. I pencil mark the 8 somewhat liberally, I think. Um, Yeah, because what I was showing was that the 8s were in one of those two positions. Now, in terms of where the 2 can go, 2, 2, this is a 2. So this does resolve itself as 2, 8, 1, assuming I'm not making an error, which means this is a 1 and this is a 7. And I think we are now there. What a beautiful puzzle. I hope, um, yeah, I hope, I hope uh, for those of you who are new to swordfishes that you've, um, and that's not a nine, don't be silly, Simon. This, I think, is an eight. <laughs> uh, this is a nine. Um, yeah, I hope that you've got something out of watching yourself. This it's been a very long uh, video today because I wanted to go through the the logic of swordfishes as well as just solving it and sort of expecting people to pick it up. It's it is a it is a difficult technique if you haven't come across it before. Um, so for that reason, I think it was worth spending time on. Now, that means that I think this has got to be a 7. Which assuming I'm just Snyder notating up here, which is always a bit of a risk, means this is a 3. We can then unwind the 3 and the 8. That means this is an 8 down here. Hopefully this means this is a 2, 2, 9 here, if everything's working out. Therefore, this is a 9, 5, five and if everything's good we should be nine and one and we're done and there we are so thanks very much for watching um, I hope as I say it was useful um, please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the content we really do appreciate that give us a thumbs up any sort of positive feedback we really welcome and we're back soon with another edition cracking the cryptic